Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the business of cannabis. On a weekly basis, Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg talk with the CEOs, politicians, and cultural icons driving the cannabis industry forward. Cannabis and politics have, for more than 100 years, been deeply intertwined. Today, Ann and Lewis speak with Scott Levinson, CEO and founder of The Advance Group, a New York City-based public affairs company. For nearly 30 years, Scott has been at the core of New York progressive politics and is right in the middle of the cannabis legalization movement in the Empire State. He knows where the bodies are buried and what skeletons are in the closets of City Hall. If you really want to know how the legislative sausage gets made, don't sit back, lean forward. Now, on to the conversation. Welcome to The Green Rush. I'm Lewis Goldberg and joined, as always, by my little jar of joy, the hostess with the mostess, and I think that's 10, Anne, Anne Donahoe. <laughs> so when it comes to cannabis, it, like, it seems like the West Coast has the East Coast beat. And given that I'm in New York and Anne is in LA, I'm sure she'll agree. States like Oregon, Washington, and California have all gone through the phases of medical programs morphing into adult use. The California model, in particular, is one that many states are looking to emulate. New Jersey, for example, has changed their medical program to more closely mimic California. New York, on the other hand, uh, New York. Well, the state has nearly 20 million residents and less than 60,000 registered cannabis patients right now. Before Canada, before Canada, before California went adult use, there were well over 1 million registered medical cannabis patients. Even though the Empire State recently added chronic pain to the list of ailments eligible for cannabis therapies, New York, by nearly any definition, has been a failed program. But things seem to be changing, and rapidly. This year is a gubernatorial election, and that's now the second time I've had to say the word gubernatorial, and I've only gotten it right once. Um, and the sitting governor, Andrew Cuomo, has directed the New York State Democratic Party to include language in the party platform that calls for adult use legalization. Could he be priming himself for a run for president? Today, Anne and I are speaking with somebody truly in the know. Scott Levinson. Scott is one of New York's most influential public affairs specialists and lobbyists. His company, The Advance Group, has helped elect hundreds of state officials from governors down to city council members. And truth be told, Scott helped get me and KCSA into the cannabis industry. Back in 2015, when the bidding process for a New York State cannabis license was first being awarded, Scott selected my firm and worked with KCSA to spell to help support a bidder. Well, our co-client lost, but Anne, Phil, and I learned so much about the industry that we pushed my partners to form KCSA's cannabis practice, and here we are today. Scott is an old friend, somebody that I've known for more than 25 years and has been a mentor to me. And I am truly excited to have Anne and I talk with him about what's happening in New York and nationally. So sit back. Actually, you know what? Don't sit back. Lean forward and pay attention because what Scott says is freaking gold. And this should be one hell of a conversation. Scott, thanks for joining us. Lewis, thanks so much for having me. No pressure there. Anything less <laughs> than gold, we're cutting it, Scott. No, I think I'll be all right. I'll try not to disappoint. <laughs> So before we get into the sausage making here, can you just tell us um, and tell our audience a little bit about the Advanced Group and how you guys got into the cannabis industry? Wow. The Advanced Group has been around for 27 years. We've been doing social activism work and electing progressives to elected office for a long time. But very early in our founding, we recognize those the criminal justice issues and the medicinal opportunities in cannabis. So we work with two of our clients, the first being then Assembly Member Hakeem Jeffries, who became Congress Member Hakeem Jeffries, who tweaked the law in New York. New York in 1979 decriminalized cannabis, but it was misused by the police force for years as a way during stop and frisk to jam up black and minority youth. That wasn't the legislative intent, and Assemblymember Jeffries corrected that. Then, of course, as everybody knows, we worked with Senator Savino to write the medicinal law in New York. That's Diane Savino, right? 
That is the Senator, Diane Savino. So, um, as I said in the open, New York State's program is widely regarded as a failure. Why do you think it was set up the way it was back in 2015? Well, New York's medicinal program, as Senator Savino said last night, sucks. (laughs) Mostly because the governor did not support medicinal marijuana use, nor does he support adult use. He's never been a big believer in the program. He was never, he never hung out with those kids in high school. <laughs> <laughs> he just wasn't one of the cool kids? Well, he had uh, his own style of cool, which was maybe uh, 10 years earlier. He did automotive repair work and loved to fix cars. And that was his passion. It wasn't hanging out in the park smoking. And that was his choice. And I think that drives his policy decisions to this day. So it was him who limited it, limited the program to five distribution points. It was him that took out smoking, though on public health issues, you could certainly defend that argument. But he was just not a believer in the program from the get-go. And that defined what the program eventually became. Senator Savino got what she could get legislatively, and therein lies the sausage making in. So I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, do you? Let's talk a little bit about Cynthia Nixon, um, because you're you know you're kind of saying that that Governor Cuomo is largely a conservative Democrat. So Cynthia Nixon is, if you took not. today, not going to win by a lot. He's conservative on cannabis. I think it could be argued that he's certainly not conservative on other issues. He's totally been ahead of the curve on Puerto Rico yeah. and on defending our nation there. So Fair distinction. Totally. Yeah, that, very fair. So conservative when it comes to cannabis. So how do you look at candidates like Cynthia Nixon? So she's not going to, like we said, if, if the vote was taken today, she's not going to win. Um, but how important is she? She seems to have driven him to the left on this. Um, and, uh, you know, is she and, and she's getting a lot of fair, her fair share of media attention. Do you think her role is, is important here in, in pushing him? Or do you think that this would have happened anyway? So I hate to be crass. But there's real power and the delusion of power. And I don't think we can mistake headlines or tweets for legislative change. The legislative session is going to close in days. We don't have adult use. We're not going to have adult use. We're not going to have adult use before the primary is over. And Cynthia Nixon is not going to win that primary. So it's quite clear that though rhetorically she's helped move the governor, it hasn't helped us substantively. And that's the real problem. Well, yeah, but, but the, the governor pushed the party to adopt adult use language in the platform. Do you think he would have done that without Cynthia Nixon? I mean, would he, would he have been this far out over his skis on this issue as he is were it not for her? As I, again, I want to distinguish between rhetoric and substance. She has definitively moved his rhetoric. There's no doubt about that. Whether that will translate into actual reform, legislative change in our state is another question altogether, and there's no evidence of that. So when do you think, you know, you're saying the legislative session is... is you know, shutting down for the summer. When do you think this issue, do you think there's enough momentum and public support to make this um, more than rhetoric in the next legislative session? Well, keep hope alive. (laughs) And uh, Go vote, everybody vote. In the power of people to organize. I think we're running up in the assembly, which you would expect to be ahead of the curve on this, against a number of problems that might or might have nothing to do with the substance of recreational use, but there is increasing concern at the lack of diversity in the industry. 
And that continues to get raised inside the Democratic Assembly and is slowing down both the expansion of medicinal and the movement on adult use. And that issue actually is what's what's happening in New Jersey. When Phil Murphy was elected as governor, he said, first hundred days, we're going to get this done. And, you know, the issue of, of social justice and minority equity ownership has really slowed down the, the, the progress in, in the Garden State. Um, so who gets it done first, the Empire State or the Garden State? Well, I think you have a governor who's committed in New Jersey and it's likely that he'll eventually figure out a way to prevail. And I hate to keep referencing Anne's point about sausage making, but there are those, you know, first of all, very few states and only Vermont, and that's not, that's really a decriminalization move. No state has moved on adult use through the legislature. New York is not a referendum state. So, there are those that believe, because the popular numbers are where they are, that it might require a constitutional amendment in New York to move to adult use. That might happen sooner than it happens legislatively. And I think, to be fair, it's likely that we're going to have to see a change in governor before we get real movement on adult use. So... I guess as you're roaming the halls of Albany, do you roam the halls of Albany all that often, or are you in New York City most of the time? I try and avoid roaming the halls <laughs> as often as possible. Okay. So, in case who, you haven't heard, nothing good goes on in Albany. <laughs> yes. I've seen a couple fish shows up there, but other than that. So in terms of, of legislation um, and, you know, below the governor um, in terms of, you know, the, the state assembly, who else should we be watching and who else, you know, who else from a, a marijuana legislation standpoint is doing really good work that may be kind of flying under the radar? Well, and you can't answer that question without pulling out assembly member Gottfried, who's been in the assembly longer than anybody else and has always been a forerunner on this. Um, Walter Mosley, assembly member from Brooklyn, is increasingly getting involved in the movement on cannabis, both on the medicinal side and the recreational side, as someone to watch. Uh, Linda Rosenthal, the assembly member from Upper West Side of Manhattan, has been increasingly an effective voice on this issue. Um, but the assembly problem is it's leaning at this point a little more conservative than the Senate. And mm -hmm. when you have the Senate likely to tip Democrat this year, and Senator Savino and Senator Kruger both on the same side of the legislature for the first time in a long time, you have a real chance on the Senate being the leader on this issue, not the Assembly. So. Here in New York City, Mayor de Blasio has been pretty outspoken in terms of saying that we want New York City to be on the forefront of adult use. He's directed the police to stop uh, arresting people for, um, f you know, for walking down the street smoking um, and just to give them a ticket. Do you think that this is another vehicle to tax um, minority and, and other um, under you know, underprivileged uh, communities, you know, if a kid's walking down the street smoking a joint and gets a $50 ticket and isn't able to, f to, to pay it, he's going to get a bench warrant. So, you know, even though they're not getting arrested, isn't this still, um, you know, a way of, of, of repressing or, or putting down, you know, minority communities? Wow. Yeah, I went there. I know. And it's a bit surprising given the thousands and thousands of folks who've been dragged off the street, dragged through the system, given a record in ways that this mayor is trying to stop. Um, there are complications, mostly starting with, though he said it, you can't give someone a ticket for smoking in public now. The law does not allow it. There's no ticket to write. So until the law is actually changed, you have a lot of confusion out on the street. 
there are tweaks to what the mayor's talking about that make it better policy, but you can't take away from him the fact that for years, black and Latino kids have been getting jammed up, given a record, given mugshots, taken off the street for smoking cannabis, and that's going to stop under this mayor. So how are you... (laughs) How are you advising your clients on these issues? Are you, uh, you know, are, are you helping them? Is your job to help them propose legislation? Is it to straight up lobby? You know, what is your, I guess, walk us through your day to day. You wake up and do what? I wake up and have a <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> that was, I knew that after the day before. Um, we're involved on a, in a number of different ways and, uh, Full disclosure, I'm still a, I'm a 2% owner of a cannabis business, so I have some of those interests. We're really concerned about the lack of social responsibility in this growing industry across the board. We're deeply concerned that there's no real indigent care program or way for poor people to not get made addicts every day. We're constantly working with doctors to try and deal with the stigma around cannabis because as we teach about the opioid crisis every single day, no one talks about the doctors are continuing to prescribe opioids every day and creating new addicts every day when in New York for chronic pain, you have an option and an alternative. So we're lucky after 27 years to feel passionate about issues and be able to work on those issues. So we're spending a lot of time with our client, uh, Bertha Lewis from the Black Institute, to find ways to diversify the cannabis industry and address just not the investment side, but the way that we have prohibited folks from going straight because they have a previous record and finding ways to cut down on recidivism and give black and minority youth a way into the industry. So you you work with both elected officials helping or or candidates helping them get elected, and you also work with corporations and helping them understand the public affairs side. Um, And clearly the the opioid industry has been really effective at lobbying, um, both um, nationally and, and, and state and local levels. How sophisticated would you say the cannabis industry is in New York in terms of lobbying, whether it be in City Hall or in Albany, compared to whether it be the pharmaceutical industry or gambling or energy? Awful. Um, and I was at a green table event last night where this came up. And, we, and by the way, we are recording this on June 15th for, for our audience at home. So um, last night, one of the things that we uh, talked about at the event was that you have patient advocates up in Albany. And those are extremely effective. But the folks with the money, who want to grow industry and invest in the state, are almost like silent investors, as if they don't need to be walking those halls that we all love to walk every day. New York legislators, to create change, need to hear from the folks who are putting their investment dollars on the line in our state. And that's true in the hemp industry, the CBD industry, as well as the adult use, as well as the medicinal industry. You have millions, if not billions of dollars that people are risking um, on a plan to expand those industries and legislators just don't hear from them. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they're reticent? They're, They're so willing to put their money up, but they're not willing to advocate. Because I think they're all a bit half pregnant. (laughs) <laughs> and they're willing to put their money up and hang out with other people in the industry who are putting their money up, but not all of them want to be identified publicly as cannabis guys. And as a result, it's affecting what they do. 
So there, there is now starting to see turnover in the licenses in New York State. You know, there, there some are being sold, and and the, the program is slowly expanding. What do you think the New York State adult use program will look like? Is it going to look like Oregon or California or Colorado, or is it going to be uniquely un- New York? Well, everything will be uniquely New York, but I think you're way ahead of yourself. The assembly is thinking now of not expanding beyond where we are. They're greatly concerned. There was discussion in the caucus this week about not allowing medicinal companies to participate in the adult use market. Why? There's a lot of concern, as I said earlier, in the lack of diversity and who's making money in this industry. And if folks don't pay attention, they're going to eventually get pushback from legislators who are responsible for making sure their constituents get to eat at this table like everybody else. It's increasingly loud, certainly in Albany and I think nationally, that this industry is dominated by white men and Frankly, that's no surprise. They are often in this country the people who have the money to risk. So so my question is for anybody listening, who should they be calling? Like which which is it? Is it um, Diane Kruger? Is it Diane Savino? Who who should we all be calling and saying, hey, get up off your asses. You're you know, you're screwing this up. And you're you're keeping people you're keeping the illicit market at a multi-billion dollar level in New York State. I have a follow up to that too. Sorry, go ahead, Lewis. No, no, no. you or can Scott. Have to follow up first. Do you want me to go? First? You go first, and then I have a follow up. So, New York is a leadership-driven state, just like most. There are uh, three men or women in the room traditionally who make decisions. All pressure, all attention has to be on the governor in this state. Anything else is completely naive. He is by far times 10 times 20 the most important voice in determining the future of this industry followed by the speaker of the state assembly carl heasty and john flanagan the majority leader of the senate and we're going to link to all of these offices in the show notes by the way and pretty soon andrea stewart cousins the current minority leader of the senate is potentially likely to be that majority leader and then will change those names. So my follow-up is tactical. What works with contacting these people? Should our listeners be calling? Are they writing letters? Are they tweeting? What's the most effective way? Um, I feel like tweeting is kind of cheap. Um, you know, if they're calling and if they're they're getting their name on record, on phone calls, on letters, what works? What, cha- what moves the needle in Albany? Uh, I hate to say this, but... Uh... A 17-minute authorized break in school is not a social protest. You need to disrupt in order to get attention. So yes to everything you said and more. So there's very little social activism out there. There's nothing that makes legislators more uncomfortable than five people who refuse to leave their office in. And it's amazing to me every year how animal activists are willing to invest that kind of personal sacrifice in ways that I don't see from those that are defending public housing. I don't see from the defenders of poor people. And I certainly don't see from those that are looking to expand medicinal use or adult use of cannabis. So you mentioned Bertha Lewis um, as a, a really vocal leader in issues or around social justice. Um, is there anybody else in the state that we should be paying attention to who's really out there advocating? I mean, is it is it the normal guys? Is it students for sensible drug policy at the college level? I mean, who who are the people that we should be looking to um, to really be pushing this forward? Other than you. Well, and I think the advance group has been leading this charge, and I'm obligated to say that, or the people at home will yell at me later. (laughs) 
increasingly dark on this discussion. I don't know whether <laughs> I, it's my serious tone or I just haven't been having as much fun as I want to have. Um, listen, there's no one doing great social activism work. And part of the problem is you have a professional left in New York who are more concerned about ego and turf than being effective. So we all feel good about Cynthia Nixon running and we all feel good about her rhetoric and it doesn't change anything. So, you know, there's a reason why it's difficult to support fringe candidates because the governor's there and the governor's going to get this done and the governor's who we have to talk to and he's been reasonable unwilling to move when pressure has been put to him and salient arguments have been made. So we talked to... We need uh, to continue to do that. Yeah, so we talked to Diane Kruger a couple months ago. Um, and she... Liz Kruger, you mean? I'm sorry, yes, Liz Kruger, excuse me. We talked to Liz Kruger a couple months ago. And she said that, that, that she thought the thing that would get Cuomo moving quickly would be seeing a line of cars going across the George Washington Bridge or through the Lincoln Tunnel to New Jersey when New Jersey goes adult use and seeing you know millions of dollars of tax revenue flowing outside of, of New York State. Is that what is going to get Cuomo moving or is it, is it something else? $450 million is the current projection of potential tax dollars in New York. That's not lost on him, and it's not lost on anybody else, and obviously he's going to be affected by the states around us and losing that potential tax revenue. But it'll come underneath him from the legislators who will be clamoring to feed their constituents with that income. So, yes, that will be a day that will likely move the governor. But he doesn't like adult use. And unless the pressure is taken to him, he's not likely to change on that. Well, I have a question. question. What's, What's going to happen, happen with this study? study? He commissioned this study. I think, I think it's completed, but it's, it's he's not releasing it. Do you think it's going to be like a... Uh, he's, he's got it stuck in a drawer and he's going to, you know, pull it out for politics sake or what do we think is happening there? Excuse me while I whip this out. All right. <laughs> Thank you for lightening this up. <laughs> this is supposed to be a fun conversation. So, yeah. you know, I'm feeling kind of dark. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know what, you know, how he reads this as, a, as Lewis pointed out in his opening whether this is really a part of his attempt to run nationally. So is he running? I don't see him spending a lot of time out of the state. And by this point, other people who are talked about as potential candidates for president are spending a lot of time out of the state. You can't count the governor out. He's got a phenomenal record. Again, I think what he's done on Puerto Rico has shown true leadership this year. And we have to give him credit for that. That gives him a huge opportunity. What's up with the Cuomos? I mean, first Mario sits on the tarmac and doesn't get off the schneid, and now his son is not going to run? I mean, this is bullshit. Uh, people like home. You know, some folks are real comfortable at home. He could kick Trump's ass six days a week and twice on Sunday. Uh, he, I mean... It, it drives me nuts. It, you know, he's got the ability. He's got the, he doesn't have quite the rhetorical skills that his father had, but he has a much better track record. Yeah, but this week, Donald Trump made peace with North Korea and talked about <laughs> No, he didn't. Peace. No, he didn't. He didn't get shit. He tweeted about, about peace. And talked about descheduling cannabis. I think every time we underestimate this guy, we get ourselves in trouble. We've never taken him seriously because he's a farce. And as a result, we don't organize in a disciplined way to take him on because we don't respect his use of power. Well, I mean, you look at, at what's happened. The, the, the real leaders, the real people who are making people sit up and pay attention in this industry, John Boehner, 
just because it was such a shock that he sat up and said, hey, I'm joining Acreage Holdings, which full disclosure is a client of ours. And, and we love these guys. I thought you guys delivered John Boehner to Acreage. No, I would love to be able to take credit for, for delivering him. No, we didn't. We, we worked with him and helped helped announce it, but it wasn't us. No, who that had, that was a rumor I had heard that you had been the impactor on moving John Boehner. Uh, I, I guess I, I, was, I was misinformed. You were misinformed, but that's not the first time I've had that happen with you. But, you know, <laughs> teasing. But, Let me but repeat it a couple more times. Though. Exactly. But Boehner, but you see, but the, the people who are leading are not the Democrats. I mean, Cory Booker has done a, a decent job of, of trying and, and you've, you've seen others, but you don't see the Democrats screaming from the rooftops about this. You don't see Chuck Schumer out there. You don't see Nancy Pelosi. You don't see these people who are the face of the Democratic Party getting out there and talking about social justice. You don't see them doing this. I don't understand it. And as somebody who who works with a lot of these people, why are they not taking a lead on this? It's not news, and there's no vote gain. That's so feckless and just wrong. It makes it, it's the reason why the Democrats lose is because they don't have the balls. 100%. The fact that no one who's talking about the opioid crisis is connecting the dots in this state that doctors every day are creating more addicts and not prescribing cannabis and no one's taking that on is a shame and a scandal. It is. It, it, every single day it drives me nuts. You know, and that we allow Donald Trump to be the one who is coming out and saying it's a states' rights issue. It, it, you know, I would vote. I would sign a piece of legislation. I mean, that is why Democrats lose. You're right, because where are our principles for the sake of principles, for the sake of doing the right thing? Our office did a study just because I was curious, and it drives me nuts. How many people in New York State? are sleeping in jail tonight for possession charges. It's almost 450 people every night, and no one is calling for their amnesty. No one is saying send these people home with ankle bracelets. No one is saying put them on probation. Why should these people see sleeping in jails for what is legal in eight states? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know... So we, we need to organize. You know, I mean, there's got to be somebody other than, than, I mean, shit, I don't even know who that somebody is, but it, it's wrong. It's deeply wrong. And to not have Governor Cuomo, not to have Charles Schumer, not to have Kristen Gillibrand out there pounding on the table and saying this is wrong, it's hard to, to you know, it's hard to wrap my mind around it that these people can, especially Kristen Gillibrand, who is who is thinking about running for president, isn't out there espousing these issues. I, I just don't understand it. You know, my, my favorite story on how this all has changed is my 90-year-old mother, who, when I was 12, made me pull up my brother's pot plant. And <laughs> when she was eight. And did she teach you how to dry it too? And then to no, no I'm kidding. That, that was fun. That was actually fun. Um, <laughs> but then when she was 86, watched the Sanjay Gupta special, and said, "Scott, we're keeping medicine out of away from children who can be helped. This is a scandal." And I believe that is the the heart of what has moved the numbers in this country. You can't give Sanjay Gupta in his change of his own personal position enough credit for how it opened those floodgates for rational policy on this issue. Our elected officials in the Democratic Party have not been screaming from the rafters. We still watch people in jail every night. We still watch patients turn into addicts every day. And we stand by silent while every other Republican, all too often, Republicans are leading the charge because that's what's counterintuitive. I think we need Kim Kardashian on our side. She can at least see Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, I mean, but but what you're saying, Scott, is kind of interesting that, you know, what actually changed your mom's mind was not a politician or it was not a messaging platform from, you know, the president or the governor. It was a trusted news source. 
Well, Bourdain was going to be that guy, you know. Yeah. You know, you know, he he was going to get out there and talk about how he used cannabis as an exit drug, um, and it, it it's such a shame on so many levels um, as a New Yorker and as a foodie that he passed. But more importantly, not more importantly, but 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 you know, of equal importance, that the the power that he would have had to change the national conversation about opioid addiction and cannabis as an exit drug. It, it's just, it kills me. Well, this whole, the fact that people are still, in today's day and age, talking about this as a gateway drug is so bizarre. It, it's as if it denies every kid who ever went to a bar mitzvah and su- sucked down a whiskey sour. Well, it's because we have Elmer Fudd as our attorney general. Well, it's not just that. It's people want to deny that drug use, whether it's tobacco or alcohol, has been accepted in our culture for years. And people use drugs to feel better sometimes or to alter their mind state sometimes or to feel differently, better or worse sometimes, as is their right. And uh, to deny adults those decisions with victimless crimes uh, continues to just be an excuse to lock people up. So we are a little bit past 30 minutes, um, and I'm sure our audience is waiting with bated breath for you to give us your puff puff pass. Um, This is our recurring segment where we ask our guests to say the two things that they love about the cannabis industry and the one thing that uh, drives them nuts. So Scott, puff puff pass. I love the fact that cannabis continues to expand nationally and internationally in availability and reduction of stigma. Is that two? No, that's one. And reduction of stigma. Um, The second thing I like is that we're increasingly dealing with the criminal justice issues around cannabis and recognizing how it's been used as an instrument of the state for generations. And your pass. It drives me crazy that we're producing all this plastic in an industry whose demographic should be environmentally conscious. I've never seen a new industry create more new waste, more than the cannabis industry is doing every day. Every vial, every vape pen, every piece of wrapping equipment is just waste. And that's a shame. Good point. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. That's one that's never been passed before. So thanks. Um, so that does it for us. Thanks again to Scott Levinson, president and founder of the Advance Group. Find out more about their work at the, theadvancegroup.com. We'll have a link in our show notes. And don't um, forget that phone number, 212-239-7323. Awesome. Thank you. We'll also wait, wait, have what's your, phone- hold on. you got to follow <laughs> Scott's Twitter. Scott, what's your Twitter handle? <laughs> okay. We'll have all of that in the show notes. Don't worry. Um, And you'll actually see that we're revamping our channel a little bit as we're now part of the MJ Today media family. So would you be so kind as to actually resubscribe to The Green Rush wherever you get your podcast from, be it iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever. Same great content. uh, And we've even posted some of our legacy episodes so you can go back and listen to your favorites. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at KCSA underscore cannabis. And if you have any questions, comments, or a guest idea, pitch us at greenrush at kcsa.com thanks and have a great day that's That's one one take one One take. take